Okay. Let's do this. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so the chapter actually gets into both um, SQL and translating SQL, HTML, and LaTeX. And I, I really literally could not wrap my brain around the LaTeX part. La LaTeX, is that right? LaTeX or what is it? Oh, is it? I think people say LaTeX, but LaTeX, I could be wrong. Well, I feel like, I mean, I'm so used to working in a biomed lab. I feel like I'm just defaulting to that, but I don't know if that's necessarily the right way to say it. So I don't know if there's a different way to pronounce it. But um, I've heard, sorry? I've always heard LaTeX for some reason. I don't know why. It's K and not an X on the end. That's what I've always heard. Gotcha. Okay, so I um, did try, um, I mean, I do have like my R Studio session up and then I was gonna actually show some code that I have there, but um, I did not go very, uh, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't have, didn't really have the courage to actually try any live coding because I had a hard enough time just wrapping my brain around, you know, <laughs> what was already done. So I'm just gonna try and explain it from uh, what I executed and what the results that you see here. But um, just stop me if you want me to pull up uh, our studio. So basically, the purpose of this chapter is how you can just uh, take straight um, HTML, et cetera, or, or, or just take any sort of, um, what is it? Um, well, what is it? Yeah, actually, how you can generate uh, HTML or how you can generate any form of SQL using uh, just a function in R. And so if you look at uh, SQL, it's relatively um, straightforward. Like you can, you can use this function, which is available in D dbfire, and it will basically give you the equivalent SQL statement. So x raised to two, et cetera, and then you have the between, and then this is the list. So I'm, I'm sure like no one has really seen SQL that looks like this, but it's, um, it's I guess it's the equivalent in, um, in R. So um, the easiest way to do this, where you can actually take um, a function in um, R, or let me actually let me just pull up the, pull up the chapter. And uh, okay. So if if you look at just like a regular HTML, I had a hard time getting this on the RMB, so I'm just going to use this. So if you look at HTML, you basically have the body, like these two tags here, and then you have a couple of um, other tags inside along with attributes. So the body constitutes the highest level tag, and then you have all of this is the heading, this is a paragraph, etc. So these are, um, the, this is basically how you start out your, um, the, uh, that's how the body starts out, and then you have all of these other attributes. So if you wanted to generate HTML from just, say, a function, how would you do it, given that HTML has just a plethora of, uh, of tags? And so if you have to do that with, um, uh, if you have to do that, oops, it's my, oh my God, where did I? Um, so if you have to do that here, what you could do is you could create a higher level, um, like an S3 class, and then you could uh, distinguish between the tags that need to be escaped and those that don't. So for example, here in, um, in this particular um, uh, tags, you see that you have this less, this less than and greater than, et cetera, and then of course you have the ampersand. All of those are actually, you would have to escape that if you did that in, um, in R. And so, oh. so if you did that, you would actually create what is called an S3 class and um, you would escape it for those where you had to escape it. So if, um, so for here, for example, so this is actually a generic function and there are two methods in that function. One being um, where, if you remember S3, this represents the class. So this, this is your class ADVR HTML and this is your character class. So this is anything where you need to escape it because ampersand less than and greater than, you would need to escape them to actually be able to get the, um, the corresponding HTML tags. So what you're doing here is you're defining a generic and then you're defining methods within the generic. 
And one is where you have to escape it for those where the characters are any one of these. And one where you do not escape it, where it doesn't have any of these special characters. So if you look at some of this, um, and the reason that you're seeing a HTML tag here is because if you go back to this function HTML, it actually does a paste and adds the HTML tag right in front. And so what you're seeing here is basically you're calling the function HTML from within this, and that's how you're arriving at this. I did have one question here. Um, so is it good practice to directly reference, um, where is that, actually here. Is it a good practice to directly reference escape HTML given that that's probably supposed to be like a private function, right? I mean, like, would you, wouldn't you typically use uh, a helper function that you had wrapped around here? So I was not sure what you guys thought about this, whether it was good practice to use HTML directly. Um, it was just my thought that it, it seemed like you should probably be using the helper function, but that was just my thought. I think that's the right practice to wrap it in HTML. Like you're, when you wrap it in HTML, you're giving it the SR HTML class. And then, so then when in the, you also wrap it with the escape, it knows to return the escape to function. Oh, I see. So, okay. I see. So couldn't you just give it the text and then it would just choose the class based on, I mean, it would just choose the function based on what class it was. Like, do you need to explicitly use HTML was my question. You know what I mean? Like if it already had these characters that needed to be escaped, I, I thought it would directly use that corresponding um, method, but I, I could be confused. I mean, I think, you know, if you don't wrap it in HTML, it's just a string and uh... So that way, when it, you call escape on it, there's no like a method dispatch happening. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, so it's it's not really it's it's not inappropriate to be doing it this way. Okay, gotcha. Okay, perfect. So basically, what we are doing here is that you're just trying to figure out how you can escape these special characters. So literally, all of the last two slides have only referenced how you can take into account that these, which are the tagging characters need to be escaped when you're actually gonna put it into R. Um, and so now let's get into the other tags. So I'm gonna go ahead, um, I don't know if I have it open here, but if you look at the number of tags that HTML has, it is a lot, it's about, I think it, it's upwards of, definitely upwards of 50. So we're gonna just reference the most common ones here, which is P for paragraph, and then under P, you have the children, which are bold and italic, so they, um, they don't actually have their own um, attributes. And um, whereas P does, because P is actually where we are looking at that, the, the start of that paragraph. So let's go back here, and here you can see that P, this is your P, and it has the, the termination character here. And then under that you have B, and, but B doesn't have its own attributes. So, in other words, you are not, you're not setting any other attributes here like you are for, for these other ones. So to get back to that, um, if you had to pass, so this was what, this is a pseudo code that you would want to be generating in HTML, where you, you would like to be able to say, hey, I want a paragraph. This is what the text is. And then I want to have these two children, uh, or so, sorry, one child, which is basically that I want this to be bold. And the class that this belongs to is my para. So that, that is a class of this particular tag here, P. So you could in theory write like about 100 functions for each one of the tags, but then how efficient would that be? You, you know, like, because who knows how many of those you really are going to use and how, how many you will need. So a better way to do it is to actually use our list too. And I know that this is now a distant memory for us because it was for me. So I went back to 19.6, which John had handled, and I just created a simple function which uh, helped me. So basically what list two does is that it refers to the dot, 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 and then it grabs it as a, uh, it creates a wrapper around this. And then here, what we are doing is that we are getting the names connected to whatever is there. So then the, the name variables, and then you um, are setting the, um, the num, which is basically the value, and then uh, these are the names. So for, for an, I think I totally botched up that explanation, but 
let's just take a look at this uh, example. If I had to call numeric and I passed it these named uh, arguments, um, and if I just use X, then you, you, you can see that what it's doing is that it's grabbing the, the uh, it's, it's basically taking all of this as being part of the dot dot dot, and then it's associating the value um, to, the, uh, to the symbol. But then here, if I create um, another, here's another function call where I'm using the triple bang here and then I'm using double bang. So here, the triple, what the triple bang here is doing is that it's grabbing all of this as a list. So whatever you have in X, right? So whatever is present in X, which is A, B, C, D, it takes it and it uncoats it. Am I saying that right, you guys? The triple bang is basically a list unquoted. Is that correct? And I, uh, <laughs> is that is that right? It's, it is a, it, It's basically a list, right? Like it, it can you can have more than one. It's not a one is to one mapping. I think that's what it does. The triple bang. Let me see. Go back to writing or whatever. Whatever. Unpack a list as arguments or a function. That's right. So it's. I think. Okay. So what do we? It's yeah. Called that's like John has the cute thing that the tops of the exclamation points are like little oh, okay. L's for list, and that and then you have three that's dots right. for the dot dot dot. So you're dot, <laughs> you're dotting your list. That's true. It's, I guess it's called an uncoat slice where you literally, it's a one is to many replacement. It takes a list of expressions and inserts them in the place of the bang, bang, bang. So what it does here is that it takes, um, it's uncoating it. So it literally, it takes, takes your values and it places them right here. And then when you have a, a bang, bang here on the left hand side, you're basically doing the same thing. You're grabbing the value that's associated with that. So, um, um, this is Q, uh, the value is nine and you're taking the bang bang off this. So then this would be Q and that's what is happening here. So you, the first one did not have any name associated with it. So that's a blank. And then you have A, B, C, D, which have these values, which you get because of the bang, bang, bang. And then the bang, bang here extracts the Q, which is here. And then the value associated with that, which is nine. And the reason we need that is because we're going to use both of these a lot now when we actually try to um, create the function that will generate the HTML. So, um, so now getting back here, uh, if you look at what they're doing here, they literally want to go into the dot, 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 and they want to be able to get everything there that's named and it's un and, and whatever's named and whatever is unnamed. And by that, I mean that some of these actually have names and they have values, whereas some of them don't. So for example, um, uh, like these are just like text, but there's no like value and there's, there's no variable and no value associated with that. So what you're doing here is that you're breaking up whatever comes in into named and unnamed lists, right? And then, um, and then there is, uh, yeah, and, and uh, if you had to look at what this is, you would see that in this particular list, you had two that were named. That's your A and B, which had values of one and three. And you had two that were unnamed, which were two and four. And the reason that you need this is because you need the tags and you need the, um, the corresponding uh, name, uh, name value pairs so that you can create your tags for your HTML. So, now, if you have to look at P, which is, um, which is the paragraph, uh, what you would do here is that you would, again, do this dots partition, which is getting whatever is in, um, in, the, in, the dot, um, in the dots, which would be all the arguments that you passed there. And then your HTML attributes is, um, I'm, I'm just going to pull up our studio here. This is, um, this is HTML attributes. What it literally does is that, it takes the list of whatever is available, I guess whatever you're passing to it, and then it just converts it into, um, depending on the type, it is basically converting it into true or false or whatever value is uh, present there. Um, and if I'm saying this totally wrong, please feel free to interrupt me. Because let's see, she's 
and yeah, I'm not sure I understand this, but if anyone else does, please do jump in. All I can, all I can, I mean, I literally, what I got from here is that it's, it's establishing name value pairs. Like, I don't know the details of what's happening here. I mean, there's a map to care, so there's some sort of vectorization function being applied clearly, but other than that, all I know is that it's somehow grabbing the name value pairs from there, so. Um, and so here, um, and this, the children is because, um, like we just said, the, the B, I to X, et cetera, all of those which come within the parent, these guys are all the children. They don't stand alone in and of themselves. They are associated with the parent tag. And so when you grab whatever B has, you also want to see if it has any children. And then they would, um, and then you would, um, oops. Oops. I feel like I triggered the Okay, and then you would get all the children as well. So let's just take a quick look at this. You have a paragraph, a P tag here, and then you have the text and you have the ID. And if you run this function, which is P, it will add the HTML prefix. And the reason it does that is because, as you saw earlier, that's what the HTML function did. Uh, we can go back to that if you have any questions. But here it adds the ID and then it adds the text. So um, ID and your text. And then it, it, it closes that tag. And likewise, here you have the start of HTML, the start of P, the closing of P, and then you have the class. And so again, these are the name value pairs. So yeah. So this would not be tagged. Um, this would not be named, but these are named, these are named, these are named, and um, that's how it's it's forming that. So um, just it, this is really similar to what you saw earlier. Just like how you got the parent tags, you're also going to get the child tags, which are associated. And here you can see that you get the caller, the calling, the environment from where it's being called. So that's actually being sent along with this tag. And then, so um, what I did here is I just ran a function in R where I was trying to see what exactly is returned when you call, um, when, when you use some of the tags from HTML, I literally plugged it into that function and I used about 20 to 30 uh, tags that you have in HTML, like address, et cetera, just to see what that function could potentially return, uh, like this tag function here. And what you see is that you, um, it's basically looking for each tag that you have. It's pasting it and adding whatever attributes are there. So like if you have the ID or class, et cetera, all of them would be pasted along with that. But look at this. It's actually sending the calling the caller environment so that it's basically returning a, 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 a closure here at this point. So you get back your the dot, dot, dots, and you get the environment from which uh, it has been called. Can so, I ask you a question? What is that? on the third line, experts dot, dot, dot equals, even in the book, Hadley's like, yeah, this is weird. Yeah, he, I, I noticed that he called it weird. <laughs> I don't know. I don't Does know. anyone no. know what's going on there? It's making the formal arguments. It's, it, you want to have the dots, but uh, you need to, you need to provide it as a name but you don't want to have a default value, right? So it's equal to nothing. It's, a, it's just a, a named argument. That's how I think of it. So is that like how uh, uh, the dark magic partial works where you can do like, you can write a partial function with per partial and you do dot 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 equals at the end. Like, so you can pass further things to whatever you partial is. No, I, I think it's it's just like it's just making a uh, a a named expression where the name is dot dot dot, and when you say equals with nothing after it, kind of defaults to the missing argument. Okay, and then you'll fill it in with a list of the junk that you're shoving into the dots. You, you fill in with whatever you want. I mean, this is just building a function, like this. 
it would have been the same way if you did function of dot 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 bracket and oh yeah, yeah i see yeah because like okay. if you look at the printout it, yeah the dot 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 is like the only formal argument so it's a different way of creating a function okay. yeah, right <laughs> Could you make this in function factories, this tag function? Uh, John? Probably. <laughs> uh, I've been on other um, other projects lately, so I'm not 100% sure, but probably. Because yeah. <laughs> when I was reading about like, or what we just mentioned about how like you want to generate this function for all these different tags. I was like, oh, that sounds like a John problem. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Sorry, okay, continue. Guys, so am I right in understanding that the crawling environment, the crawler environment has been passed along with tags, so you're returning a closure here, correct? A closure here. This is not just like a, um, it's not an expression. What you get back here is a closure, yeah? Is that right? Yes. By closure, you mean in including an environment that is the function, like the function is an environment? Uh, no, the, the environment, I guess the calling, the caller environment, that's, I, I'm, I'm guessing that's why this is called caller environment. And also when I put it in our studio and I ran that function, I did notice that it had this thing um, to the end. So each one of this is one of those uh, tags, you know? There's about 40 of them which are named. So there's, uh, let me see if I can find one. That every, okay, so for example, body, which we all know. Um, so, um, so what caller environment is doing there is if you just created a function inside of that function, the environment of that created function would be the um, function environment of tag. Okay. But since you give it caller environment, it's making the environment of this new function be global. It's, it's, or wherever it's defined. Oh. So it's making it act like a normal function as if you had defined it at the top level. Did that make sense? Oh, I see. So this actually makes it, a, it, the, it this would be considered like, it would, it would make it basically equivalent to the global environment here just by adding that to uh, Yeah, assuming this function is called from the global environment, then the function you create is in the global environment as if you created it normally, which cool. is, that's a big part of what my package deals with, is making the functions act like normal. And then we actually went back and sometimes you don't want you sometimes you want that weird environment because you can make crazy guessing games and stuff so yeah i mean isn't that what all the code the, the coating and uncoating is all because you're trying to take into account that people could be calling it from weird environments right and that's the reason why you have that flexibility of quasi yes yes so. yes and, and yeah and so the reason it's color color environment here is wherever this is called from it'll act as if you wrote this new function at that place. In that place. Okay, gotcha. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, Can we talk about the bang bang paste? Uh, sorry. Why? I, maybe I'm just blanking. Yeah, yeah. I was actually, expecting yeah, the bang bangs to be on about. variables. Why is it on paste? I think it's because. Well, I think it's because they see how in the output the HTML paste zero and it's got the slash B like in quotes. If you if you didn't tell it to hey I want you to evaluate this paste zero right now, then the HTML function would would quote that and it would still show up as uh, you know paste zero of paste zero. That's like a forcing evaluation. You can yeah. try. Just I guess I, was just, I, I, I thought it would be on, on tag. I thought it would be paste zero less than thing. Well, than it's, it's because you want that whole paste zero expression to be evaluated before the function's created. And so you, you don't want it to show paste zero. So yeah, like, like Tyler was saying, um, the result of that is the quote, uh, less than B, unquote. And it's because you bang banged it. Otherwise, it would, it would say 
pay zero, you know, you would say that, that all of that. <laughs> there would be two pays back to back if you didn't. Right. Pay. Yeah. That's how Think, um, so actually here it is, um, let me just see if I can run this on. If I run this, oh, I might have to mute it. Yeah, it's a good exercise just to recreate this and then just get rid of the bang bangs and see, see how it changes. Yeah. So if you, if you run that right, Maya, it, it ends up looking like this. So this is what you actually generate. Um, you see how you don't have the quotes there. So I think that that's the reason why you have the bang bang before because it's basically generating this and you want that to be um, bang bang before you. I think you're, are you showing us in our studio screen? Yeah. Oh, you can't see it? No. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. This is the story of my life. I go through like meetings and people actually have never seen, that, seen what I wanted them to see. Okay. Uh, okay, hold on one second. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so here, if you look at this, uh, Maya, this is actually running um, that or something similar to that. And what it, what you get out of this is, um, this. Um, so, I think that's the reason why you have the bang bang, right? Because you are actually wanting this to, you want to, you want to bang bang it before you call it, before you actually call the paste part. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Okay, so then similar to the tags, you also have something called void tags, which basically is like, just long story short, things like image. I think just you just share your screen again. Oh, now you're seeing the art studio. Oh my God. I'm such a mess. That's why I just share my whole mess. I'm just like, screw it. You guys are seeing my desktop. <laughs> the problem is I have so much of PHI, which I all, all poor practices uh, so it's just like all there and so i'm just like eh. and seriously if i quickly get my act together it wouldn't be so bad but it's, I'm, it's, um, i can't find it anymore okay share um, okay all right so similar to the other tags like p and the children tags like bold and italics etc you have the image um tags which don't have um these are considered void tags because you see how you have img here but then you don't have like a closing uh whatever thing here so these are considered uh void um void tags for whatever reason and so you have to create and take them into account so now, if you guys remember, we created a bunch of, um, we created some special cases for the escape characters, and then we did some for the named and the unnamed, and now we are doing it for the void. So we've already like gone through four levels of specifically looking at um, the kind of tags that you could encounter. So if, this is really pretty similar to what you saw earlier. You are just looking at um, the ones which uh, are, are not going to be, the, basically they should not be, uh, uh, they should not have any name associated with it or they consider um, white tags. Um, so these are some of the tags that you could encounter on HTML. Um, and I think some of these we have probably seen like HTML, H1, the paragraph, and, um, and then these are some of the voids like IMG and some others. Um, and so he has, um, and because there's so much of overlap here with some base R functions, I don't know which ones there are, he actually suggests that we create lists and put them there. So then that way you're not actually going to cause any, um, any sort of a clash with, uh, if, if they are in your global environment. So um, he creates this thing called HTML tags and then it's, uh, and you're passing your tags and void tags, which you just created now. Um, Here's tags and here's void tags. And um, you are basically uh, creating all of these functions here in this HTML tags. So, yeah, so this is like, my God. So we went through all of that for this. Like this is 
just so dense it completely defies logic. So um, here he is. So the ENCO, as you guys know, is basically closure. So it is sending the environment in which whatever has been, uh, whatever this has been defined in, is is what you have here in code. And you are kind of cheating here. It's this is basically data masking, as you guys know, because that's how eval uh, tidy works. But here you're actually sending it this group of functions so that you can you can uh, interpret that within whatever criteria you have set up. So literally, this does everything that uh, applies everything that you have um, um, that you have done so far. And here are some examples. So if you call your with HTML and this is your the code that you're passing, which is whatever you want to render as HTML. Um, it spits out this. So you, let's see now, you have the HTML and then it starts out with the body. And then you have the H1 and then the ID, of course, that's your text. And then it closes that. And then it opens up the child, which, um, which will also, uh, yeah, which is right here. Um, B. Yeah, okay, so the child is within the parent, sorry. So yeah, so B is still within the B tag. And then image, which is a void tag, right? So it, um, I'm a little bit confused as to how this got quotes, you guys. I'm not completely sure. I, I tried to like actually debug this, but I really, I was, um, I, I, got, I got pretty lost. How do these guys actually get the quotes around them, the width and the height? Because that seems to be true of all uh, these attributes here. So I don't know if anyone can tell me something. I think you have to go back and look at uh, how the IMG function, yeah, IMG function was generated. Oh, for mm -hmm. the um, well, is it the IMG or is it the tag functions? I feel like it's um, it's probably yeah. The, so it's, it's the tag one, right? And it's like. Yeah. Handling, it's like generalized enough so that it'll handle that case yeah. where it'll, it'll wrap uh, things as well. It's in your um, map character, so it's converting to character right there. So it maps okay. your function, so take dots on name, escape them all, apply, and then turn all of that into a character vector. So when you get a number and you pass it into a character vector, like with an as character, it makes it into a character, and so when you print a character, it has quotes. So it does, it quotes it immediately when you put it into a character vector then? In that oh. character. I think that's where it's coming from anyway. That's interesting. So I wonder, so doesn't HTML have any case where those attributes don't actually need to be quoted or is this like across the board that all of them would need to be within quotes and they're all characters? I, I guess maybe that's pretty genetic. So you don't have to use special case classes there or whatever. I don't know. But I was like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is literally like all of the meta chapters in like four lines. And I thought it was pretty damn amazing. So I did try, a um, so I tried using the selection uh, gadget, whatever, and tried to like, you know, go back to like Wikipedia or Facebook and see what I could do and see how much I could generate. The problem is all of them, a lot of them use JavaScript, which um, Hadley does make the case that it has a script backslash script thing. So it doesn't really work. So I did try, um, I, I just plugged just a bunch of things in there and I thought it was kind of neat though. It, um, I actually got this from the selection. I mean, I, I was looking at the selection gadget thing. So it, Hadley actually hid the, uh, the thing that quotes those. It's if you, um, it's that HTML attributes function, and oh, he he says, down? yeah, he basically says this is deep dark magic. You can look at it if you really want to, but it does complicated things. And apparently, one of those complicated things is put quotes around the uh, the attributes. Is are you talking about this? It's uh. Oh wait. It's plural oh. though, but yeah, yeah, there we go. See, it's putting in the, oops, the um, single quote. Yeah, oh yeah, that's true. Why is that so tricky? <laughs> that's not... That doesn't seem that trippy, but that's singular. And then what's, so the 
plural is doing a map. I don't know, it's not that trippy. Yeah, it's kind of like EXPR, EXPRS, I guess. It's more, it's still. Hmm. It's just doing HTML attribute on more than one HTML. Like, and, and it's doing things like converting true to oh, yeah. character lowercase true, um, whatever. <laughs> oh, and I guess he goes into the random, you know, specific escape rules and maybe he just didn't want to go over that in the chapter. Oh, I don't think he wanted to explain the HTML. He wanted to explain how it got converted. Yeah. That's cool, though. I didn't realize that this thing was here. That's a wonderful cat, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Wow. Okay. So, um, so that's all uh, from me, you guys. Um, my voice was shaking the whole time, so I'm very glad I'm done with this. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was really awesome. Ah, oh, yeah. you are too sweet. You will not <laughs> say otherwise, Maya. So I don't, I don't trust you anymore. No, I would be like, oh, good. You know, this is kind of ironic. You suck. <laughs> it's well, ironic because you're so always good. telling everyone it's really good, but we won't. We're not allowed to tell you it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Sweet. Should we jump into Jake's portion of the evening? I'm excited. Or does anyone want to talk about this chapter a little bit more? Has anyone converted that latex stuff to its own package? Or is that kind of like already done in our markdown somewhere? That's what I was thinking. That was really interesting. Maybe that's what we can work on as like a project as we're done with this book. Yeah, I also liked how he laid out like um, the game plan for creating a DSL. Like Tyler, I don't know how serious you are about a stand DSL, but if we wanted to work on that, it would make a lot of sense and be helpful to like start with that high level. Like, okay, this is, this is the game plan for how to attack this. Because I thought it was interesting that for the HTML one, Hadley builds from like simple use case and then extrapolates. But then for the LaTeX one, he goes the other way. So I don't know, just thinking about those things as a developer was interesting to me. Some of it requires certainly domain knowledge. Like, you know, I'm not as a super stand user, so I don't know what all the different ins and outs and right. the syntax and the language are, but if you know what the syntax is and that kind of dictates how you're gonna, how you're gonna build the structure. And like knowing that there's, for HTML, there's just certain rules for how things are put together. And the question is how do you most easily implement that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I like think, the little text. Know, the, oh, sorry. Yeah, you know, I was gonna say I think the the translate SQL you're looking at that's closer to like what the LaTeX uh, uh, example is doing. Yeah, Tony, but, if that's not already a package, maybe that'd be cool to do, even if it's redundant, because that's cool. You have to do some like AST recursion, and we could get like really masochistic with it. I think you're muted and talking, or you're just <laughs> upset. <laughs> oh, that, I, I clicked a, there's been a lot of loud noises in the background here, so I turned it off. Um, anyways, uh, there's some packages that will convert like model outputs to like a LaTeX out, output. And I'm wondering if we could like look at some of that and get some ideas, or just kind of start from basis from what he's already shown. Cool. All right, well, if no one has any other questions, Jake, I think you have the floor because I think anyone has the ability to have the floor. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, well, I'm excited that you guys, well, excited and completely nervous uh, that you guys are gonna take a look at this. Uh, our package I've been building, I'm gonna put the, the link in the, in the chat window, but this is uh, a package I built called Shiny Objects. And the main purpose of it is for debugging, uh, debugging Shiny code. So currently, when you build a Shiny app, you've got 
like this input list object, which is um, responding to the user messing with the inputs, whether they're clicking buttons or checkboxes or sliders. Um, and because that's not actually happening in your global environment, you don't have access to that input object. And so it's like kind of hard to troubleshoot the code. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Share. Okay, so, so even if I, there's, there's like a little video, like a 10 minute video on, on how it works. Um, but essentially it looks through the code and, and pulls stuff out and then puts it over in the global environment. So although within some, I think this was like a shiny app function, there was a server argument, it went in and found, I'll just zoom in a little bit if I can. Um, so there's like my DF is a reactive data frame, mean vows is a reactive list. Uh, I've got this output plot. And um, if I was just trying to, to debug this locally, like without actually running the app, it'd be really hard to do so because I don't have access to this reactive object. Um, so shiny objects will take this and, and rewrite this and make this a function. So then uh, my DF, which is my DF with parentheses, is now an object that you can interact with. So it will find my DF as reactive. It will change this to function. Put this is the arguments. It'll take the arguments and then put that into the body of the function. Um, so then my DF ends up down here as a function. And when I call it, I have access to the columns. Um, and then output plot becomes, uh, there'll be an output list and, and plot will get added to that, which will just return this plot. Or if it was output table, whatever it is, it'll just like store that object over in a list called output. Um, I know that there's like other ways of debugging shiny code, like putting browser in the code or um, doing other little tricks, but we do a lot of prototyping with some pretty big data sets and it can be pretty slow to, you know, have a, an inefficient, inefficient code as is and then uh, like wait for it to, for the app to launch and then like trying to debug the code. Uh, it's also just harder for me to step in and help people debug their, their apps. Um, I do, that's like one of the hats I wear is helping, helping folks debug code. And so shiny objects, this allows me to like step in really quickly, like hone in on the problem area and then like, let them uh, go on, on their merry way. Um, so right. I have a high level question for you. Yeah. Um, Shiny's like, now that I know a little bit about closures, you're trying to take these different objects that live in different environments and then shove them all into the global environment? The global environment, or you can specify where you want it to go. Like you could save it, you could put it in a, a new environment if you wanted. Um, that was like another question I had for you guys, the like trying to get this released on CRAN, they did not like that it was writing to the global environment. So. Uh, I got around it by making a menu that said, you know, where do you want to put this? Do you want to put it in the global environment or a new environment? Um, because I, yeah, I was still new to all of this. I still feel very new to all of this. So um, Tyler just said, uh-oh, is that because of the global environment comment? And how do you get around that? Hold on. I can't. I can't uh, it's because I, I heard an alarm. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> like a siren <laughs> sorry right, yeah. yeah i can't quickly toggle to the comments so please just uh shout them out if, if folks are saying stuff um, <laughs> but uh yeah so so all right so the the main the main thing is doing so i've got this shiny app i've got server i want these guys in my global environment so when it goes and it run and it reads the file that I have open, it'll bring shiny library shiny over. It will bring this like input object over, but then it's also going to like crawl through here and find the server argument and then find these guys and rewrite them so that they're um, things that I can access. So like I was, I was saying, like the, if you could use like event reactive, like that's going to change that to a function. The render table stuff is just going to end up being that reactive data frame assigned to output table, output plot, this render plot function is gonna get changed to record plot. Um, so yeah, it's just like, 
finding the guts of this server call and then like making those the actual steps that I want it to run through and then um, putting that all into, it finds all the things that are either libraries or assignments and puts it in the global environment. Jake, did, yes. did, did you do that before the users put any information in? Like if there's a pull down menu, you haven't, the user hasn't done anything yet, it's just from the startup of the app? Um, so it doesn't even run the app. So, so you, you couldn't like change a variable and see how that trickles through the different functions and see how so it. So that's what this, oh, that's what this dummy input is about. So if you just write dummy underscore input and then um, give it values that will work. So like I'm waiting for input button, I'm looking for input X. So you just put these in here. Um, it will find this dummy input and then write it as input list and put that into your global environment so that you get access to it. So you could come in here and say, uh, you know, make X 10, make X 100. Um, I think it's, I, I, this is a little bit of like a workflow shift for how shiny, I guess like most folks shiny workflow, but we are really trying to tackle technical debt on my team. And it's really nice to just see, you know, a little dummy input list that says, you know, these are the types of values my user is going to be um, passing around the dashboard. Um, and it just gives me like a quick high level expecta expectation of, of what's going to, what kind of, um, yeah, values my dashboard's gonna be responding to. Does that make right. sense? So, so if I, so like when I'm debugging, I might just substitute out, you know, input button is false, input X is 500, um, just to kind of play around with it, especially for like a ggplot or something where the Y axis could get all weird or, um, yeah. Any other questions on what the, what this, our package is doing. So how does Sorry. What's that? Uh, I was I was asking how does how does it do it? Do you parse the text or just parse the code? Um, All right. So on top of this being already like a kind of unique way of <laughs> dealing with shiny, which I feel like I've I've had a, quite a bit of pushback to. Folks seem to be kind of uh, resistant to, to using this workflow. Um, people did not like that I was using regular expressions to do all the work. So uh, I've been going through all my code and rewriting it using uh, expressions instead of regular expressions. We're trying to dig yeah. into the and stuff. But it's, uh, I, I definitely feel like I'm in over my head. I've pieced some of it together and, and you guys have been really helpful on uh, on Slack, helping me understand some of the, the nuance. Um, but yeah, uh, Maya and I thought it'd be a good exercise to kind of <laughs> test your knowledge of the book. I, I, the, the way I see it is, you know, with the server function, you could just, I mean, you can run that. The what function? You can run that function and it, it's just defining uh, a bunch of objects that will exist in the, uh, in the environment of that server function. And then you can uh, basically extract all the objects, all the named objects out of that environment. And you could inspect those named objects. And you know, that when, if you were to run that server and say, say you ran it and put a browser like right at the end of it, and probably our sort of introspection, then DF, is going to have a class of whatever the output of event reactive produces. And so you could say, I, I see that in the environment, there is this DF object, and I know that it is uh, an event reactive. Like, sure. Yeah, I mean, using browser in the code is definitely another I'm, one. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that like, that's how it should yeah. work, but in terms of how you can see how the what I'm talking about might work is, you know, put yourself into the function environment, and see that these elements are all defined in there. And, uh, you know, I, this, I don't remember, I don't know exactly how shiny when you run, when it executes the server function, like what is the actual output, but I'm, I'm assuming that somewhere in the server output is a list of all these different elements the DF and the output list and the input list and all those different things along with what different names attached to them are. Um, yeah. So you could, you could extract it from the, the executed server function. 
I don't know if that's if that's the case. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, all right. So let, let, let's let's look at another another thing that's a little tricky about this problem. So the second thing, oh, the second thing that's a little tough is I don't know why I'm getting like a lag on my screen. Um, is that that server, the, the guts of that server function can, can be in a lot of places. So it could be inside Shiny app. It could be on its own and then pass to Shiny app. It could be, um, yeah, and then like that Shiny app could be inside a run app. Um, you could put a list inside run app with the server, or you can just have a dot art. Yeah, you could have just a, a file that has, it just starts Shiny server function. It doesn't even get assigned. Um, so it's kind of like five different scenarios where I need to go looking for um, like what's what's in the like what, what's the content of mm -hmm. server. Um, so it's just another part that that's kind of tricky about. Wait, but you're saying right now you just use you like you capture the body of the server function as text, and then use regular expressions to find the. I was. Now I'm. I'm, I'm I'm doing it differently. Let me see if I can uh, update expressions. I don't know why I'm getting a lag on my on my computer here. I think Zoom's kind of eating up a lot of my I mean, my RAM. I'm guessing. All right. Well, it doesn't want to seem to open that file you can keep the video um and then try it because that that takes up a lot of bandwidth say that again video. if you can take if you can switch off your video and just share your screen that that could help like sometimes it's helped me okay thank you yeah i'm uh i think i turned it off yeah okay um so i'm still like leaning on regex a little bit to find certain certain patterns but then i'm um, using them as as calls to, to kind of go and grab I have this like return inner expression that's going to go and say well inside that call like find find this this element sometimes I'm looking for this value expression sometimes I'm looking for server um, and then I grab all that I was using B quote but it looks like there's some R lang equivalents that I could be using um, and so I'm like finding I'm just impressed that you were using B quote. What's that? You're like, I'm just impressed that you're using B quote. I'm guessing if you search, uh, GitHub. this has been so wild to try to like on my own figure out. I, I've like because I think you would find very few instances of B quote outside of Hadley mentioning that nobody uses B quote <laughs> and that it's too bad because it's a quasi quotation function in base R. Um, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, this has been like such an undertaking, um, and I have to really like refamiliarize myself with what this code is doing each time I get to it. Um, but the section that I pulled out was just trying to find that server code. So I have like this file, and then um, like parsing it. And I was thinking we could just go through and and kind of clean up this code with like the best practices for actually um, pulling out the, the content of of server. Um, and I have a couple of helper functions, so I just put them down here um, so, that, so that we can reference them. I will say a thing I have learned that I learned too late was the best thing we can do is you go through like how it works and everything we're working towards, and maybe we'll do like one little piece of it, but the real magic will happen in the channel afterwards because it's hard to write code in, you know, a Zoom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, get us started, like show us where you want to start. Yeah, so I have this, um, let me just pull up that, that guy, demo our run app, shiny app that's assigned. I apologize for the wait, it's still, it's still opening that file. Oh, importantly, uh, Sticker Mule has a huge sale on stickers this week. Oh, nice. And yeah, I did. I did you you should stickers. print. Um, 
you definitely should print because you have an awesome logo. Thank you. <laughs> and eventually we all want copies of that uh, sticker. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I have them. I just need a, a venue to, to pass them out. <laughs> oh, um, it is a massive sale. Yeah. What's that? What is a massive sale? Instead of $69 for 50, it's $9. Oh, for that is a huge sale. <laughs> Now, technically, it's the three-inch ones, so you have to tell them to print it as if it's a two-inch sticker, or otherwise you end up with the uh, you end up with these that you can't use because they're giant. They're the size of like your head, but don't get three-inch stickers. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna run the function. So load reactive objects. Uh, so I don't need to pass it any arguments unless I want to change um, the environment it's going to write to, or there's like some other things you can do, like restart R and stuff. Um, so I just say load reactive objects. It's going to say, uh, where do you want to put this? Again, a bit of a lag here. Um, so I want to put it in my global environment. Then it's going to say, do you want to use the file that's currently open? This has been really cool to explore the R Studio API. Uh, so I'll say yes, that's the file I want you to use. Um, that's coming through because I think, uh, yes, I don't know. Sometimes when I'm asking it to like go find plots, it like throws some weird warnings, but that's just it uh, executing um, like these guys inside. So now I have my DF over here, which should be uh, six lines of, of the car's data set. So if I call my DF, I have access to that and um, LTF is a list now and output plot. Usually you don't, you're not able to see. Uh, I can now, it's now stored in this output list. So that's what, that's what we're going for. And then I have this, um, this dummy input list and it found that and made those, those items here. So I've got X and, and Y um, in the list. So that's, that's like the goal of shiny objects. Um, and in this example, um, we need to figure out where, where is server? So is server like assigned by itself? Is server sitting inside shiny app or is server sitting inside run app or is server actually the shiny server, uh, standalone, which I think I haven't solved for yet. Um, but, uh, so I just want to find like where, which line has like the server. So. Um, the, the way that I'm, I wrote the code is I said, uh, find, find the line. So, so, so just go look and see if you, if you see anything that says shiny app followed by server somewhere in the call or run app followed by server somewhere in the call. Um, and if you do, then, then go pull that code. Otherwise it looks for, um, server just being assigned by itself. Um, what is all of this indexing? Why do I have all these indexes? Yeah, what are these? Yeah, so let, let's bring these in. I'm just going to clear the environment. So that's the file we're going to use. This is the code. So we so we can view the code. Um, yeah, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get inside here and then inside here and then inside here, the server. And I'm trying to grab these guys and move them to the top. Like move them so that they, so what is there? There's, there's these two, these two items. I want to like get rid of this line and just Put, put them there instead. So I'll have the shiny, I'll have library shiny, I'll have those two items that were in the server code. I don't need this line. And then it's gonna look at this and bring back the input list. But because all of this is, yeah, indexes, um, that's, that's how I'm like trying to go find them. Is there like a fun, cool way to traverse the AST to look for the word server? Would that be useful? It, could be. I just think server could be in a lot of things. 
um, like, I don't even know, server theme. Like, I could just see people writing server all over the place. Um, right. But, yeah, I'm, like, totally open to, to some method like that to, to tra traverse the, yeah, kind of, like, with the, the AST to, to find it. Um, so first big mistake I think I'm probably doing is, well, we can come back to this one. I think this is, like, treating this as, as a character is maybe not the right thing. But, the, like, one of them is, I'm just trying to figure out, like, um, is, uh, is that step an assignment? And I, I, I just don't know, like, what the right way to, to say, like, some of the code, like, is it, is it an assignment? I feel like what you want to be doing is like capturing the run app call with those objects and then like inspecting the objects afterwards because the app are like the I'm finding it. But so like the run the app from Shiny must have like some kind of handling to understand server.r global.r www blah blah blah, right? Say it again. Um, what I was saying was that instead of trying to like string search your R code to find whether it's like where the server lives, you could like, you know, like capture where that run app works. So instead of run app, you run, you press like, you, you change the run app function so that instead of running app the way you're doing it right now, you like assign into like you overwrite the run app from shiny to just Run you the run your thing, and then you parse the objects that are passed into the run app that would normally. I, I would even say make a function that the argument to the function is a run app call, because then run app does its thing, whatever magic it's going to do to figure out where things are and whatever, and then you are capturing and parsing that. But I think I mean I think we're basically saying the same thing. Tan, that just make the user tell you a little bit more than you're having them tell you. I think it's basically what it comes down to. Because, you know, you're, you're helping them debug. They can do a tiny bit of work to tell you, okay, but what is your app? So, however that is done, for example, by saying, instead of run app, you know, maybe instead of run app, it's um, debug app. app. I think it can just be in so many places. Like, they don't always use it as run app. Like, they could call it yeah, but I'm saying, run app. Well, let me, before I commit too much, let me pull up my, uh, <laughs> let me see how broken, how broken my most recent shiny app would be in this. And the answer is, all the broken. Could I still do a uh, shiny app call? So I've still got an app that you could capture. So I, I, I think making them pass an app in, and then they they'll do the work of figuring out where everything is. Um. I, I think that is possibly a way to make this a lot um, less confusing. And, you know, you only need it to work for your use case. And it's still a useful thing because if you don't cover every way that someone can write a weird esoteric um, shiny app, you know, that's, uh, that's what version two is for. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have an issue that says, like, use some of the like go go look at some of the legacy ways that you could write shiny because I think uh, at some point they said well you know we had a couple ways you could you could run your app but the preferred method is like one of these two instead of like the five that I identified. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so maybe I'm not sure what what we should do with this exercise. Um, I don't know if you want to still. Kind of look at some of the other steps, or like, what's the right way to to just capture? Like, is is this step an assignment or not? 
Right. Um, I want to know, um, like, like one of these guys. I think what I've done is look at the class of the left-hand side of the call. Um, I think they always say, uh, so let's see, this guy. So if it's a symbol. So, so this one? Yeah. Um, Is that the ASP one? Kind of. So yeah, what is the class of that? It's a name. That's dummy input itself. Are you not looking right. at the language object that's on the page? So if yeah. it's a yeah, if it's a call, that's gonna be why is this also a name? Like both of them are names. So an assignment is call the assignment function the name that you're going to assign it to and what you're assigning into it, right? So that's what that whole call is doing, is it is calling the function arrow dash with argument two being dummy input and argument three being that language object. You're, you're putting class, but I bet if you put is dot symbol that would be true. So would I... Mm, so are you guys call, suggesting like look for so is symbol is false? false? Because any, because a symbols are always going to be languages, right? At least that's my understanding, the bigger umbrella. Yes, I think. An interesting question here would be like, how does Styler know to convert some equal signs to arrow, like arrow signs? Ooh, that is a good question. I was looking at linter and it's just way too convoluted for what you're trying to do. <laughs> I did think about styling their code before I, before I get it. Like I mean, I go that would help debug both. things in general. Right? Like as, a gen as a general feature, forcing them to run Styler on the code will help you debug it. That's true. Because, yeah, like, dealing with the equals, that, that's, that's a big uh, headache. And if you kind of make them use the arrow assignment, then you know that's assignment, not an argument. So like one of Styler, one of the things Styler can do is literally a change every time you use equal to assign and instead use an arrow. So that's one of the things that you can make it do. Um, right. And it must parse the code in the same way. Right? Yeah. What is what is styling the code going to achieve? Um, it's just like we, we won't be looking for an equal sign. We'll always be looking for an arrow. Got it. Yeah, it intelligently like detects that you're assigning with the equal sign and replaces it with an arrow. But so either, yeah, I was trying to look at their code. So either use Styler to tell you how it works. Um, and learn how to detect the difference between equal as assignment and equal as an argument. Or, like Tan was saying, just force the styling as part of this debugging. Because what you're saying is, hey, I'm going to help you debug your um, shiny code. First, please apply a universal style to your shiny code so that I can help debug it. And I think that seems totally fair i think i can do that under the hood yeah. also like I don't, yeah I don't right yeah yeah you could do it without actually saving it i think local um local there you go yeah um i i don't know either like i would even consider importing styler in your package and saying this is part of what i do in order to debug your code 
I style your code because come on. Um, but I don't honestly, know, anyone using an equal sign, would they be like, what style guide says to use that? Uh, well, Python, something like that. Other yeah, a lot of I did for a while. I, I was I was one of the one of the holdouts until uh, actually until I learned Alt minus on. Oh, good! Uh, I'm the host. I could boot yeah. you from the room. <laughs> like I think no, I think a lot of people do like assignment. I use assignment or like left arrow, but there are still people that stay like kind of true to equal sign. I'm like, you know, I don't know. You can't just say that. Just like right, people. yeah. So I think I think I would plan to internally style it using Styler, whether you do it in their code or not. But then I think you I could can... even you could even like throw a message in the function that you're styling their stuff if you wanted. I, I think that there is some valid argument that there are people who'd like freak out and need their equals. They're wrong because exactly this case that R is really nice. You can tell the difference between assignment and arguments. But anyway, I, I, so I would, number one, I would use Styler to, to take care of this problem. Sure. And then what you're looking for is a call to uh, the assignment operator in the AST. And then you don't have to, you're not really looking for, you know, you don't have to parse it of I'm at one, one, you just go walk the entire tree and look for a call that is that, and it will have two arguments. The first arguments, the left-hand side, second arguments, the right-hand side. But um, what if, what if they're like assigning inside a function? It would still be, so I'm saying, you know, walk all the way down. Oh, but you only want the top level actually, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you would look for when you find an assignment operator, you don't walk that tree any further. I'll, I'll throw uh, a, a wrench, but I mean, this is an edge case. That you're, it's not going to be easy to deal with if somebody uses just a sign, like not left assignment operator. But <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> or, or, you know, another example is I've, you know, I've created uh, a large number of reactive objects and I just do that with like a per walk to create them. Yeah. And you're not gonna get that from the code. Yeah. You you have to ruin it to, to know that they were created. Yeah, but you're advanced and you're debugging on your own, okay? <laughs> well you can write the PR. You know, you can write the issue and then submit the PR to deal with your case. Well, this is what I was trying to get at. I mean, like, there must be some way to capture when Shiny starts to execute the app, it executes this server function and it creates all these objects and they are stored somewhere. Yeah. They, um, it actually does a step. And stub out the function. Shiny actually does steps, at least on the UI, and Tan knows why I've looked at this recently, but I think also on the server where it like normalizes the app inside of run app. And so you might be able to, to take advantage of some of that and just do that and then see what the output is. And that's what you're parsing. Now, where it gets tricky is then, you know, presumably you want to tell people you have an error here and or I guess, I mean, you're not truly trying to tell them that. You're just trying to create the things and then they can play with it and find it. So, so yeah, well, I think yeah. I think you can, I, what I would do is, and you've already been doing it, so it's a good sign of, you know, just look at the code of run app of, um, uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, of shiny app, all these shiny functions, because they do some weird magical things on the UI argument and on the server argument to normalize it. And you could probably do some of those same things to make things less confusing to walk.
Um, but danger, just warning when you start walking down that path because like, did you know that UIs are functions too under the hood? Like, so <laughs> you can go down a real deep rabbit hole, but you're like you're close to having this like as like a really functional package, but I don't know, yeah, you could end up with like corner cases with well, yeah. I, I guess the other piece is it it basically works, right? So oh, it totally works. Like yeah, I have like um tests and I use it almost every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, my team uses it. So cool. I mean, it's been really helpful. Also, we we mostly work in Flex dashboards and not like we don't even touch shiny, like proper shiny. Oh, um, and it works just as well for that as like it, it doesn't matter uh, if it's uh, .r file or .rmd. It it will do the same on both. So in that case, I would definitely say take a small corner of it, and not every use case, not every possible way of it working, and just write that one corner rewrite that into our line, but everything else, it just uses your existing code and then start scraping away at it that way. And, you know, see if once you've done that one corner, if you're like, oh, that was hard, never mind. Yeah. Because I, I don't that's care if I people was, are, like yeah, if people are telling you, oh, too. you're using reg regex, that's wrong. Eh, if it works, it's, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah, there's, there's like this, this um, constant uh, philosophical flux that I'm in, especially now reading this book that like every chapter, I'm like, oh shit, I can refactor my code and make it so much nicer. But then my client is like, I don't care about the back end. Like just make it, just make it go. Um, but yeah, just uh, piggybacking off of what John said, if there's like a very specific, like this works, I just wanna make it prettier. Maybe we could solve that together in the Slack. Yeah, maybe I'll just like go through and, and pull out some 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 questions. Like this was throwing an error, so this isn't the right way to to check. Um, so maybe I'll put that in the Slack. Like, what, what do you actually do to to make sure that that's a you know we'll we'll force start on the code, but what actually tells me that it's a um, that it's an arrow. Yeah, I, I can just start going through and, and picking out little pieces for us to, to dig around. Yeah, but I do want to just say that I appreciate you going through the source code. I thought this was a lot of fun to look at this. And um, yeah, it's just, I think we could apply some stuff, but I think this package is really cool. I also... I'm trying to wrap my head around like creating reprexes out of your use cases. And since it's such an entangled big mess, I feel like we needed to do this. Uh, I have, I do have one question though. What's up with, what's up with the curly braces? So when it finds, so when it mm. finds, <laughs> when it finds the server line, um, so we can get there. Let's see. Uh, bridge code. Oh. Oh, you know what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, talking about you. So where's mine? All right. So it, it's looking at the right thing, and then I tell it to. Sorry, my mouse is frozen. So. When it goes and finds it, uh, it kind of like keeps these guys. Yeah. We'll remove that, but we'll keep the braces. Um, I guess I just wasn't really sure like what to do about it. Or if I have server. That would be somewhere where I think, um, was it standardized, standardized call? Call standardized? I think. They're call standardized, yeah, yeah. Can, because uh, the problem is sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily have to have the curly brace. Um, well, well so I'm trying to, I'm trying to get these guys out of here. I want like these to be like at the top level. Um, so okay. I told like, go find the guts, <laughs> go find the guts of server, which it says is a function, it's perilous. So I'm trying to grab the body 
and then I want to take them out of the body and just put them at like the top. I mean, do you want to just call body on it? Uh, can I do that? It, that would only work if you if it was captured as a function. Well, yeah, it would be. Do you want to call fn body bang bang server expression? Is that the function in your the package you're building? No, fn body is uh, from our line. Oh, okay. So FN. Can we all have a prefix? I don't think that so, would work. Uh, Maybe it would. Yeah, it should. <laughs> bang, bang. Because, yeah, you, you, you have to run the, you have to, like, have to turn it from an expression to an actual function. function. But that's where I think bang, bang, server ex expert should do it thing. Finish typing. I want to see. Type faster. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I think. Uh, oh, Arlang. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Oh, it's, it's, okay. So, body's not uh, quasi. It's not quoting? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, let's, let's not do that. Let's do. Uh, anyway. Uh, no, do it without the bang bang in that case. I mean, we. It's not a closure, so you need to <laughs> eval it, or you need to do body of eval. That's code. Okay, so uh, hey. it's server code, and then one, uh, two. What is that? <laughs> this is like that John thing where you're like subsetting the. Thing and like delete dropping. Was it you're signing null into the first one? Yep. Is that what you're doing there? Yeah. It's almost exactly the same. Yeah. Where I just wanted to convert, uh, convert it without evaluating it, which I, I need to go back to that code because I understand this stuff a lot better now, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, not not clearly true from this our conversation right now, but. All right, so th this is anyway, so, what so, I was trying to find. So if I have this, you're thinking I can grab function body out of this? Uh, no. Yes. Well, you have to, Arling, you have to eval. You'll, yeah, you'll have to evaluate it. Of, not, not bang, bang, yeah. There you go. OK. And then. That you know that object will if you use fn body it'll always have curly braces, which you can then consistently get rid of if you want to get rid of them. But that way you know they're there if you use fn body versus if you use body, they may be there, they might not be there. Now what if I'm going to screw you over? I'm just going to put superfluous braces around my entire body so there's two layers of braces. <laughs> well, you just again you. Uh, you you walk it you you iterate yeah, until you yeah. don't get a curly brace. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, why is this confusing? <laughs> like I just think like it should and standardize this? itself, you know, and be like, oh, I actually get rid of like when you do parse. Oh, parse that's I text, mean, it should just get rid of all that. And I secretly, that's that. what a lot of R lang is for. I think is they got sick of the fact that R is really lenient. You can write it a million ways. And they're like, oh, right. this is awful. Can we just make it all be the same, please? And I think that's what our lang is based on. I'm just gonna grab this because that was <laughs> that was interesting. Oh my god, this project is so challenging. <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm with Tan. Just like find all these guys, and and like move them, move them in the in the code. So where we start. Yeah. <laughs> this, all these. Wait, what happens if I parse this? Wait, what happens if I eval this? That that's what. Uh, so factory so looked that, like at first too. The step we were just doing is this, essentially. All right, so this all like, moves <laughs> to the left. Um, but then the next step is like kind of substitute out all these guys and, and rewrite them. 
um, which we we won't do today. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's that's what this power clip score. It's 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 really interesting, but challenging. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, it's very cool, and I I would definitely start slicing at it. I, I mean, I say this, I just totally rewrote two core packages that I use at work because of this club. Damn it! So. <laughs> It yeah. happens, <laughs> you know. Like, oh, this would be so much better with S3. Oh, and so would that one. I'm gonna stop so. sharing my screen. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I really appreciate all the help and, and input here. No pun. Actually, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> uh, input, right? Yeah. Wow. All the help and arguments. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm the host and I have to go. So right. I think this is a perfect time to say over. thank you so much, Jake and <laughs> yeah, everyone. You. And we'll see you next week. All right. All right. All right. I'm very, very nervous to I, about stopping and recording, but hopefully I figured this out. Uh, yeah. Hopefully. Don't turn off your computer if you can avoid it, please. Because it okay. has to process the video. All right. I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.